Hi guys, Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house on a Sunday, well, my case, evening. But the writer I've got with me today is her afternoon. So as you go, that's a good hint. We're going slightly further afield. Now, this is kudos to my good friend, Bella Kenyon, because Bella put me in contact with this lovely lady about chatting with me today, Elizabeth Horan, who we're here today to talk about her most recent book, The Mask. But we're certainly going to be talking about some of her other books as well, because I knew about one of them, and she just told me about another book which just come out, which I didn't know about, but I want to learn about that as well. So now, Elizabeth, obviously, for people who don't know you then, obviously, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them, obviously, where you're originally from? And what started off your creativity? And obviously, I know you've done several books before the ones we're doing today. So tell us a little about everything. Okay, we'll start I will. Off. Thank you, Andy. It's First of all, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Isabel, for hooking us up, for getting to chat with you. I'm thrilled. Um, yeah, so I'm a I'm a 46-year-old mom. I live in Vermont. Are you really? You don't look it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of came to motherhood a little bit later in life. Um, I have two young boys who are 9 and 10. Um, oh, I'm full they're, age. <laughs> they're here with play dates now. So there's six kids out there running around. That's why I was a little late to come in because I was like, I'm just getting them settled. I'll be right there. <laughs> so that's really, I mean, that's my life is... is being a mom I'm a stay-at-home mom um and I let's see I came into poetry also late when I was 40 um so I had two little babies and I um I used to be like a waitress and a like a law assistant I really kind of wasted like 25 years of my life with like jobs that I hated and kind of self-harm and not great you know like from trauma that I couldn't handle and didn't handle it well, like just fell into a bad uh, 20 years or so. And then I decided once I had children that I wanted to do something better. And um, so I went back to school and got two online master's degrees and started writing poetry. And I had my first poem published when I was 40. So that's six years now I've been doing this. Um, and I, once I got going, I couldn't stop. Like I had so much to say, it just, poems just would fall out of me in the middle of the night onto my phone, whatever. And um, people, you know, were interested in them, I think, because they're very raw and they're very real and honest. I mean, the majority of my work is nonfiction poetry, I would say. Um, and I like, you know, the, I like for my poetry to serve the job of like being a voice for those who might not have one. So, you know, I write about things that I've experienced, but that also people, you know, have stigmas about like mental illness and um, addiction and trauma and eating disorders and, you know, all of it. So that's kind of, I don't write a lot of like happy poetry, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's okay. That's just what I do. Um, I mean, there is a belief in poetry because I, a lot of mine is, uh, this is what you obviously, I'm a very, very serious poet. I'm probably, if I'm honest, and you're probably the same, there's a lot of things I'm not serious about, but poetry is one, and reading your work is obviously the same. Yeah, right. I take it, I do take it very seriously, and I want it to reach people who who could benefit from knowing they're not alone in something. So yeah. you know, with a lot of my writing, I, I had really severe postpartum depression after my second baby. I felt a lot like Plath. You know, I survived. Plath didn't. And that whole book that we I showed you just a minute ago is about that. How do you survive? Um, how do you be a brilliant poem and have these dark thoughts and young children in the next room and you're losing your mind? Um, yeah, so it's, it's really things I, think I like. Parenthood is a strange thing for people. I don't want to yeah. go too much detail, today, but I know my sister, unfortunately, had a miscarriage she did some years ago. Yeah. I know she got pregnant with my nephew, not thankfully, not long after. And I know what that did to her as well. And it was yeah. like, it's somewhat where I mean, it's poetry is something it's a good vein to get it all yeah. out of your chest. And then you just yeah. put, put your mother face on there, can't you? Right. And, and miscarriage is one of those topics. You know, it's not like people, people don't really talk about it. It's kind of like a hush hush private thing. But almost all women I know have, have either experienced one or someone really close to them has. And so it's like all pervasive around us that massive loss. And how do we cope with it? And I think writing poem, I have written poems about it and I think that's good. Like we should talk about it, you know, and you're not alone. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm glad, no, I agree. She, I'm glad she could have a baby to term. That's great. I agree. Now I'll say, um, 
obviously the book I've yours I've not read yet, as you just told me about. Um, this is worth us bringing up in that topic of conversation straight away with the book obviously you've done about just the right of the stove, oh. which which you bought out. Was it last year as well, didn't you? So which yeah. anyone's looking in now, they can see you waving this in the camera in this house. <laughs> I was like, I want to show you my pretty book. So yeah, this came out um last uh about a year ago. Um, and this was with um Twisted Press with um, Renee Ferrer. She's out of Philadelphia and we've worked together before and she's just a lovely publisher and human. Um, so this really, you know, Plath to me is an icon and like a sister in pain. Of course, we need to mention obviously this book is about Sylvia Plath first of all. Right. Yeah, yep. your main reaction is a wonderful and sad, yeah. very tragic Sylvia Plath unfortunately. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about, you know, it's, it's two mothers in her kitchen, me and her, it's me talking with her about, we're like sharing poems. I kind of ask if she would like help me, you know, she's very, she kind of is like protective of me, but also kind of dismissive. Um, so it's like, she writes, writes to me and then I write back to her. So it's the two voices. Um, and I, it was my, it began as my thesis for um, my poetry MFA and ended mm. up being a big collection. So typical. It's, it's typical. I think sometimes it's typical that way poetry books go sometimes where they take off in different directions, don't they? So yeah, I, I had like a base for it, um, which was Bad Mommy, Stay Mommy, which was my first book with Isabel. Um, and then it became this this big collection. So yeah, I'm proud said. of it. And I oh, hope yeah. Sylvia would, would, you know, not be offended. We'll just say that. Which yeah, of course. Now, I've got to <laughs> ask you, obviously, about this, because I kind of... Um, did you have to, did you have, did this take you a lot of research to get the voice for the voice in this? Do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it 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 took me reading as many of her poems as I could. Um, it took me listening to her read poms on YouTube. Um, I read that's some a fantastic, fantastic reader. Stuff. Really, I've got about I've got about an album of her, two album two albums of hers yeah. in this. Her nature. voice is so. Uh, it's, comes from beyond the grave and it's so striking and so I don't know what um uh, surreal to me to hear her read a poem of hers so I just I mean I would really just kind of try to you know like seance with her which sounds kind of wow cheesy, but wow. sit with her poems sit with my pain try to put myself in her shoes at different points in her life for particular poems and then, I mean, and, and I think this with all acrastic type work, and I call this acrastic just because it's like about someone's life. It, it's a frastic about her poetry, I guess. Um, to just then just let it go and just see what happens, to, to let her speak through me, to trust that it's gonna be okay, you know? Um, and it, I really would go very, very deep and I had to be alone, the house had to be quiet. It was a very much like a spiritual writing sessions that I would do these in. Now, how long did how long did it did, did this book take you to write? Then was it? I'm guessing it would be the thesis. It went on for a few years, and didn't it? In total, yeah. It um, I would say it was about a year and a half all told for that, including the semester that I wrote the thesis in. That's pretty um, good. I still got going that really, one. I wrote it really fast, to be to be honest. Like after I had the base of it from the thesis, um, and I finished that that MFA, and I just wanted to write. I just wanted to. I just you know, I, my, my kid was finally in, my kids were finally in preschool and I was like, I'm just going to write. Um, I felt like I was making up for lost time, you know, so it was very frantic writing. Um, but oh, it, no, no, brilliant. But it's, for me, that's the best kind because it means it's coming out right and it takes less editing. It's, I'm not like struggling to find the right words. It's just flowing. And, and that's how I feel when I write for Sylvia. And it's also how I feel when I write for Frida. It just, now, it just obviously we're here today. Obviously, that, that's a very clever link, that now, isn't it? <laughs> so like, we're here what? today because I I knew about what we saw with Sylvia Buff just before we came on air. Now, see, look at this now, everyone. Now, fortunately, people on the audio version of it, so only we'll see obviously Elizabeth pointed up a book called The Mass now, which is about Frida. I, I can never get Frida's surname right. Is it Frida? Frida Kahlo. Kahlo, that's it, yeah. Yep. So yeah, Perksman dyslexic, unfortunately. Now, <laughs> Now, obviously, The Mask is obviously your current, uh, well, the book I've read, actually, certainly, which has come out oh, back in the last year, I believe. This was, uh, I think it came out in November of last year. Yeah, obviously right. by, so by, by, 
by the wonderful Broken Spine over in Southport. Yeah. yeah. Like, who, who I've met, obviously, I've, I've told you before, I met Paul as one of the guys in that. And yeah. there's a story yeah. around that, which I certainly can't repeat on there. So. Yeah, no, not here. No, no. No, but like, Paul's a great guy. So. Mom. But they're, yeah, they're wonderful guys. And they're dear friends, you know? So the whole experience, you know, I've known them for some time now. We published one of Paul's books at my press, Animal Heart. Um, so we got to work together really intimately and his work is brilliant and Alan is brilliant. And so we just, you know, I kept writing Alan like, hey, I've got some, a new thing I could show you. Like, I really want to work with you if you're ever interested. And I would kind of just, you know, sh pop up now and then, hey, <laughs> it's me again. No, I've got, I've got two Paul, finally... I've got two Paul's books. And I think one of them with your press archer, I'm sure it is. But anyway, so I know when I did an exchange with Paul a couple of years ago on books, so yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm a yes. great guy. Now, I'm trying to, mm -hmm. obviously, so I, just kind books... of, I just kept knocking at their door until they let me in to do a book. <laughs> well, you got them by the throat eventually, you mean, basically. <laughs> now, obviously, gently, um... though, very gently. Yeah, gentle frock, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, obviously, with the mask, then, obviously, I know this is your second collection of that fear, fe fe isn't it? So, and obviously, people are interested in learning. Obviously, your first one came out, was it 2020, wasn't it? Yeah, so uh, here is, this is self-portrait. And yep. this was my first Kahlo um, work. And this was, a, this was kind of like a work of my lifetime. I mean, the, the Plath book and this book really you know, the two collections that are the most expansive, the most massive, the most amount of kind of blood, sweat and tears um, that I'm very, very proud of. Yeah, this came out and this came out 2019, the fall of 2019. That was kind of my big year where I had all these books come out. Wow. Um, so like I said, with Cephalo and um, it's, it's really a biography of Frida from the time of her act, horrible accident in Mexico City, which left her um, disabled and injured and in severe pain for the rest of her life and unable to have children through to her death. Um, so each, each poem represents one of her paintings from the start of that to the finish. Um, so it's true acrostic, you know, each one correlates to just one painting and there's about 50 poems. So it's, it's big. Wow. Wow. Now, obviously, I know with that book, and I'll say reading up on you before, I know you've been appreciative of her uh, uh, art since your college days, haven't you, since 97? Well, did I read that yeah. correctly? <laughs> I, so. Yeah, I graduated college in 2000. So, yeah, um, I first, I, I think I was taking like art appreciation or I was taking something and I saw her work. And I think the first one I saw was like the, de the wounded deer, you know, and the skeleton, you see her, her, the column, La Columna. Yeah. You know, and wounded, those wounded, the wounded, it was just incredibly striking. They're incredible. Art. They're, they're so raw and stark. They, they're unapologetic. They're everything I like about poetry, you know, that like, I can just say whatever I want and, you know, that's that, that's me. Like, I don't have to filter. Uh, you know how in your regular life you filter so much and, and it's like, my poetry is my place. I get to be completely straight up and raw and visceral. And so me writing about her work, it like took me to another level of that kind of raw visceral honesty of physical yeah. pain, of mental pain, you know? And so I just went with it. <laughs> and what's the story I read before about you seem to all seem to click for you in 2018 when did you break yeah. your back as well fall of a yeah. horse? So I had oh, 2018 was a tough one for me. I um I first uh what did I do? I fell off a young horse flat on my back in a frozen driveway, you know. Oh um so I crunched the bottom of my spine, basically. I had compound fractures in the lower spine. So I was in bed for, and I had a mass, wicked concussion with it too from the whiplash and um, like crawled home, got home. You know, there was nothing to do about the back injury, but rest it. So I was in bed, you know, a month maybe on and, you know, mostly. And um, I went back to Frida and I can't remember how or why, but I, I mean, I knew in, from my MFA, I was, I, I think I wrote a couple of acrostic ones in that MFA. And I said, when I'm done with this, I'm going to revisit Frida, revisit Plath, do all these things I want to do. And so I just started writing about my injury and her injury. Um, later that year, I had a miscarriage. Um, 
I, it was, I was 43, so I was older, but I really wanted that baby. I mean, you know, it, it was like my rainbow baby. My second baby had been so hard, didn't sleep, didn't eat like that. I got so, I was so depressed. And I was like, I just wanted, I wanted that baby, you know, it felt like a miracle. And then I lost it. And it was like, <sighs> Well, who do I blame? How do I cope with this? How do I let this anger out? You know, like, I mean, am I mad at God? It wasn't my fault. And I, again, went back with her and so many of her paintings and work is based on miscarriages and her, and the abortion, the forced abortions, um, that inability to have children walked with her every day of her life. You know, I was able to have two, you know, thank God. I, I'm thrilled. I love my boys. But I can, I can get into that psyche because I came to motherhood so late, I couldn't get pregnant for like five years. So I, I was sure I wouldn't have kids, but then I got lucky and did. So it's like, I could just, I can sympathize with her. I can sympathize with women who feel like they're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to have children. Isn't that like our purpose in life? You know, that pressure to have a baby, especially in like 1920s Mexico, I mean, women had babies like that's what you did um she ended up not doing that and doing her art but she had so many animals like in her in her compound she had deer she had little dogs she had parrots monkeys and they were really her her children her babies she loved them so you know <laughs> all of that kind of so to finish up 2018 the miscarriage exposed that i had um cervical cancer Six months later, I had a hysterectomy, Baron. You know, uh, so that's that. And um, this book, I just kept going and going. Yeah, I got the thing also. That's when obviously you kept going and going and going. And when yeah. did you realize that you'd have a second collection about her, uh, which is of the mask? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I, um, I mean, I feel like I could still write a third. You know, there's so many pieces of hers. And each time I look at one of them, I have several that I've done like more than one poem about like really different contexts. Um, but I, it, it's so easy for me. Like when I have writer's walk, I'm like, well, I could just do an acrostic one to, with Frida to get going again, because it's like, I can produce that. Um, this one is more, this one is not like a full biography. This one is more about her bisexuality, um, gender, about kind of females roles about um, her and Diego and uh, also their infidelity and her like affair with Trotsky and how she interacted with Trotsky. So it's, it's more kind of political, gender, sexual. It's not based on the accident, for, so, so to speak. Yeah, no, so of course. It's just a deeper dive into aspects of her life that I connect with, you know? Yeah, um, of course. And of that course. I'm fascinated by and about that those relationships with her animals too is also I touch on. Um, but it was just, it was like, when my book came out with Cephalo, you know, they weren't in a great place. The book didn't really go anywhere. Um, and it was like, I want to try again. You know, I really want the world to see my freedom poems, you know, and rather than, you know, have a meltdown about that book, not taking off the way I wanted it to, let's just do another one. <laughs> so just I, say it's, I always believe it. it doesn't work first time. Try and try again try again and, and you know if people notice the mask then they'll notice self-portrait and so on so you know it's like you got to just keep trying and I, I maybe I'll do a third one you never know I don't think I could ever exhaust my fascination with her no you've clearly you quite clearly got an obs oh, I don't like the word obsession but no. it's like um <laughs> there's a clear it's like you look like um light bulb in your head there's something connected to you hasn't there yeah. so mm -hmm. that's why straight up a little bit now why did you call it the mask then? All right. Well, uh, so one of her one of her more striking paintings, in my opinion, that I didn't know about until writing this book, is called the mask. The painting is called the mask. It's near the end of her life. People can Google it. Just Google Frida Kahlo the mask painting. Um, she's she's got you know most of her, she has so many self portraits, right? This one though, she's literally wearing a mask with these two teeny cutout holes. It's very sad. It's blue. Her hair is uh, colored blue or purple. Like it's not even really her face. And it occurred to me, you know, she's been painting her face in, in all these, you know, hundreds of self-portraits her whole life. 
at her death, she chose to do this one where she actually covers her face because she feels like she's dying because she feels ugly because she feels this or that. But so it's like, to me, it was like, was she wearing a mask all that time being beautiful? And this is the real her exposed. Like it, this one painting with a literal mask, just really, I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around it. I still can't quite, I mean, it's debatable what the point was or what, what she felt. But so the book has two poems, The Mask, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and um, they kind of act as sandwich bread for the meat inside. And I just, where she was at when she died in, in so much physical pain, in so much mental pain, in debt, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think I think she suffered really so, so much sorrow and knowing she was going, was ready to go. But, you know, like a sadness, like a short Yeah, yeah. No, so, to what I've read about her, I, did, I didn't do it. I've not sort of the same love that you have said, but I do remember being aware of her work when I was at university back in a few years ago. A mm -hmm. very, very sad lady indeed. So it's like the part of pain she went through, you can, I, yeah, I think she covered a lot more than probably four people had in a lifetime, really. Right. And I mean, between just the physical pain alone and painting on your back in bed in a body cast, like, how do you find the um, determination to even do that? For me, I was like, you know, I would just well, probably lay it has to be, It is, Will. Yeah. And I think if you look at, like, obviously what you said before, the pain you've had, I've had, I've had two, three big, I've, well, during my lifetime, I've been, I've had, as an adult, I've discovered I've got two major health conditions. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, I contracted diabetes. And it's, it's not on top of that. But I think you learn sometimes that if you want something so much, and in her case, she wasn't going to give up. And this applies to you as well, and probably me as well. As an artist, I mean, sometimes you have, you have to have the pain to actually get to what you want, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, and uh, the pain can make great art, can't it? And it can yeah. make great poetry. Yeah, so no, I definitely that one. So, but yeah, no, she never gave up, and she never stopped working. And it's it's such a it's such such a tragedy that she died poor because now, of course, she's a world icon, you know, and her her fame her fame and you know the worth of her her work is way more than Diego's ever was. Yeah, I no, mean? I agree. It's fascinating. You think with someone like that. The same goes Sylvia Plath, really. Is that, I mean, you could, would you right. people have loved them so much if they'd lived to old age and right. made load, millions of pounds right. or dollars off the you world? Imagine if she had gotten to write for 50 more years, you know, what yeah. she would have done with that. And and if if Frida had had not been injured, what would her what would her but what would her art be without that yeah. injury? You no, know, it'd be completely no. different, I imagine. Yeah, it would be. Same as like with you know, the classic British poet in England, the Wilfred Owen, for example. He wrote, we saw examples of his poetry before he went to the First World War and died there. Mm. I think sometimes the grief, something horrible's going to change you with your attitude and your work sometimes. But I don't know. I want to ask you about, obviously, a couple of core quick questions to conclude with this. I want to give you some time to read out some of your work today for us as well. Now, obviously, with obviously the mask then. Now, um, there's two, two questions we'll ask with this one, and we'll do them one by one. I know, obviously, with some of the pieces in this book, you do go into, oh, I think it's Spanish in it. Yeah. Certainly yeah. now. What made you want to start bringing a bit of Spanish into this collection? Well, um, for one, I feel like to be kind of genuine to to Paolo, who was Mexican, um, I, I needed to have, try to make it sound as authentic as I could. Um, honoring her, you know, her nationality and her ethnicity. She was, um, her father was German. Her mother was a native like Tijuana from near Mexico City. So kind of more an indigenous Mexican culture. And she had to kind of marry those things. So she was like, on one hand, this kind of aristocratic uh, mm -hmm. European beauty in some times. And then also liked being kind of this, this woman of the earth, this native Mexicana, Tijuana. Um, and she wrestled with those identities. So, so much about her life is like this duality, right? So she's kind of this two, two sided creature. There's her and Diego, you know, there's, it, it's, it's, she's, there's men and women. It's great. You know, it's like, there's so much like that with her. Um, these two sides of a coin that somehow come together and make this art. Mm -hmm. 
I, um, in back in college, went down to Puebla, Mexico, and I st spent a semester there. I fell in love with a man named Alejandro, who was her first boyfriend, who was on the trolley with her, um, <laughs> but was only minor injured. And then he left for Europe after that. So she, it was her heart, first heartbreak. Um, my situation was similar. <laughs> my Alejandro left me and at the airport, I went back down to Mexico to like go marry him and he never showed up. You know, it was like the ultimate, oh, poor me gringa left at the, <laughs> left at the hypothetical altar at the airport. Anyway, um, <laughs> so it's another parallel I feel with her. But what was good is I came out of it knowing Spanish and I've, I've worked very, very hard over the last, whatever, 25 years to keep that Spanish. And this, I feel like, was the reason I finally got to use it um, in my poetry for Frida, for something I love doing, and to honor her. So the, the self-portrait one, the first one, has a lot more Spanish, and it has translations provided kind of within the poems. This one, I did less Spanish because we didn't want to add the translations. I wanted the, the, the English-speaking reader who knows no Spanish to still be able to stay with me even when I peppered in some Spanish. Um, it's an excellent idea because look at you, you've done it. My, my Spanish isn't fantastic, but I managed to work it out what you were right. doing in this. Right. I think that's probably enough something, it, yeah. So you could, you could, you're still with me. I didn't completely lose you. You know, you might not know what a word or two means, but you still can be in the context with me. Um, but I just find it, I don't know. First of all, I think the challenge of writing in a bilingual voice like that is awesome. And I love it. And I love like when, you know, weird slant rhymes happen between English words and Spanish words. And, you know, you can play with it and even more so than just with one language. So like, I love that. Um, and I think it makes the book really unique, to be honest. Oh, it does have a really, really good feel to it. Now you wrote to us before about the editing process for this with Broken Spine with Alan, weren't you? So obviously the wonderful yeah. Alan. Now obviously to conclude before we get down to obviously to where we get your book from. Tell us, obviously, you're quite clearly, you worked quite hard in this book with Broken Spine, which I think is more than some other publishers will do you. So tell us, tell us a little bit about, little bit about that process. Yeah, yeah, it, it did. And Alan, um, bless his heart, was so patient and so supportive. I mean, I really kind of brought him like a working manuscript. And I was like, here's what I have. This is my, my vision. I want to do this one with Frida. He was intrigued because he, he, he had seen, he'd heard me read from the first book when I was in Southport with him in 20, whenever. Um, so I kind of brought half a book, you know, and he's like, okay. And so we, we gave, you know, the whole process was quite long. I mean, I think we, I think he originally agreed to work with me like that Christmas before, and it took that whole year to bring it out wow um and so i just would you know it was like okay i gotta write some more poems for this i gotta i had a lot of pressure on myself to write really extraordinary poems and send them to alan <laughs> you know <laughs> like i was kind of i was really obsessed and i would send one and he'd be like lovely this is great and i'd be like no it's not good enough and i would do another and another and finally he's like ellie this book is good like you're good you can stop now. really <laughs> but i just <laughs> It was like, you know, I'm, I'm a, a real perfectionist and I, and I wanted it for Alan and Broken Spine. I wanted it to be so good, you know, and I wanted it to be so good for Frida too. And I had, I was kind of coming off a, a difficult time, like with COVID, I wasn't doing so well. I wasn't writing a lot. I'd been kind of hiding from social media. And so it was like, this felt like a comeback book for me of like, you know, and, and I'm like, I hope these are, I hope these poems are as good as my old poems, you know, because I'm kind of a different person now, you know, they've morphed and changed. And I think it does. I think writing, helps. writing as in the, as in the nature of all us writers, it does, you do develop and I think move on as we go along really, don't we? So it's, it's really easy to find self doubt, you know, as a poet, you, you're just like, am I still good? Am I still relevant? Like, am I, too, is my brain too damaged to do what I used to do? I don't, you know, and it's like when that gets into your head, it's really hard to sort through. Um, no, no, it's that so point. Fair yeah, point so. it's, it's really, I, you know, whew, we're, we're so hard on ourselves, you know. I think um, writers are naturally, we are hard yeah, on ourselves. Right. Right. And artists as well, obviously, I think even harder. I know, few, I know, I know a few professional painters, and they're even more rigid than themselves than actual writers are. Because I know, I know one writer. I'm not going to name the person, 
I saw them. I know they spent six weeks in the painting once, and they hated it that much. I went out the went out the top floor of their window in the flat, and they're right. fourteen floors up and nearly hit somebody on the street below. Yeah, yeah, That's I why. think true. I think you know, as creative people, whether you're visual or you know, singer, but we're we're I think to be really creative, you're also really sensitive. I yeah. I. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Because you yeah. have to be able to empathize with other humans to understand yeah. the emotion and the humanity and everything. So it's yeah, like, no, I agree completely. You can't now, just be a, a brick wall, you know, that, that can is stoic. Um, no, I agree. I agree. So, now, start winding down now, obviously, because I want I want to get you give you a chance to read out a few poems for us in the second half, mm-hmm. and I've been conscious of the time here as well for you as well. Now. Yeah. Obviously, um, we've obviously hinted at before that you're thinking about possibly a third collection in Frida's voice, if that's the right word. But do you have anything else lined up before that yet in mind at the moment? I do. I have some things in the works. I have a manuscript that's out being considered right now that's a really hopeful yes with them, which is about, um, well, it's based on songs by Fiona Apple. Um, oh, my, my, my wife would love that, Amanda. Yeah. She, she, uh, say, I think, if I could be wrong on this, part of them, I'm um, a massive love of Kiefer Sutherland. Ralph, I'm not sure if that's over to the music or anyway, that's a story another day. I know yeah. she absolutely worships Fiona Apple, she does. There's a there's a real niche following for Fiona. Like if people, if you like her, you love her, you know? And she was such a poet in her, she is such a poet in her lyrics. But so this was an acrostic journey, but with music. And I, I was excited to try that. I think it's really good. So that's hopefully going to show its head at some point, um, maybe in a year or so. And then I actually have a, one um, that's with Sarasa's poetry. Um, it's called Blank Space. And it's, mm. it's really about kind of my year of 2020 um, with COVID home with my children, isolated with my children. Um, I'm not sure. I, it's got a lot of good parts to it, but it's not quite found its shape. So, you know, putting manuscripts together is like it's like a puzzle. You know, you oh, it's get difficult, it right. difficult. And, and you do you find, and obviously, Elizabeth, it. with you obviously writing quite a few books over the years, some books are easier to get into an order than others. Because I've done six, and I think there's only been the last two that have been fairly straightforward in order. Yeah. The first four were nightmares, and what's going to be the seventh, possibly eighth, a proven absolute nightmare, like like detective novels trying to get the pieces in the right order. Right. That's right, because in the wrong order or the wrong strategy of telling the narrative can make or break it completely. You know, you yeah, can have yeah. really good poems lined up, but if they're not telling that narrative, it's not going to work, you know? And so I think that's one of the hardest parts of, of, poetry is if you want to do a chat or a collection is that 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 publication part that making it whole part it's easy to write one or two poems and put them aside but then to actually create that book that works is really something um and I like to help like my mentees that I work with and stuff with that because like with order with segues with pauses you know because it's it's a big it's all big concepts that if you're not used to doing it or you haven't struggled through it um you don't know where to start. <laughs> it can feel really intimidating. Yeah, no, I agree completely. So now to wrap up, obviously, I want to we want to get time with your poems next. But if people want to get hold of your obviously your books and then I'm guessing that all the ones we've talked about today are available from all good and evil news agents, as the Empire Magazine podcast always says. So they could pick them up in all kinds of places, can't you know? So yeah, they're every, I mean, I have an Amazon page that has all my books. So if you like Amazon, you can go to Elizabeth Horan, poet or author. You'll find my page. You can order any of them from, from there. Um, I'm on Twitter at Ehorn Poet. Um, I'm on Instagram at Ehorn Poet. I have a website, ehornpoet.net. So lots of ways to find me. Um, specifically, The Mask, if you would like to support a wonderful indie press, um, go to brokenspinearts.com, I think. Right. I think, I think, it's that. It. I think it's that. Yeah. Let's just double check that. You've got me wondering myself that. Order second. from them direct, or you can contact me and I'll ship you a book, you know, or I'll get Alan to ship you a book. No big deal. 
Um, I'm going to be at AWP in about a week. <laughs> oh, this, this will go on late. This will be out later on now. <laughs> I can tell you right. that now. <laughs> it's an American thing, but uh, but we will be there and we're going to, we have some of our UK people are coming over to hang out with us. Like it's going to oh. be a real party and a blast. Thank God for great. Sounds you know, a great time, but definitely sounds brilliant to me. Right, we'll wrap bye. up part one then for you. Let's, let's both take a quick break. Uh, we should be back everybody in two minutes' time when well, I'm a, we're going to negotiate now. How many pieces Elizabeth's going to do for us as poems now? So okay. <laughs> we've, got, Very good. we've got plenty to choose from. See you all in a minute, guys. It's been a pleasure. Been grateful today.